Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Today is a great day for Illinois as we take yet another significant step forward for reproductive justice. I want to express my gratitude to all the advocates and healthcare workers for your tireless efforts to ensure quality care for the people of Illinois. The three bills that I am signing today send a single straightforward message. Illinois will always be a place where women have the freedom to make their own medical decisions. Making that possible are the many champions of that fundamental right who make Illinois a safe haven for women seeking simply to control their own health care without interference from the government. First, our great Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton and leaders like Senate President Don Harmon, Speaker Chris Welch, Senators Selena Villanueva and Lakeisha Collins, and Representatives Yolanda Morris, Anna Muller, Dagmara Avilar, uh, all of whom were instrumental in moving this legislation through the General Assembly. The Director of the Department of Human Rights, uh, practitioners like Allison Cowett of Family Planning Associates Medical Group and uh, Dr. Jonah Fleischer, director of CARLA, who have all faced unprecedented challenges in a post-Dobbs world and met every one of them with grace and resilience. And advocates like Sarah Garza Resnick, who carry the load in the halls of the Capitol and getting voters to the polls to support abortion rights. Also joining us today is another steadfast advocate for reproductive health care um, who will join us shortly. I think he has not quite made it here, and that's our Attorney General, Kwame Raoul. He's on his way. Uh, but it is Kwame Raoul as Attorney General who ensures that all of the work that we need to do to protect women under Illinois law is actually achieved throughout our state. I want to thank you all for your continued partnership and your steadfast commitment to the health and freedom of women in this great state. Across the nation, we can see extremists are ramping up their efforts to restrict and punish women seeking to exercise their rights and control over their own bodies. We can't wait around and be reactive when the latest attacks come. The pro-choice majority in this country need to be proactive. We need to expand the infrastructure and resources necessary for women to exercise their fundamental rights. We need to build in greater protections so that no one has the fear of retribution or liability for uh, obtaining safe and legal health care. And we need to ensure that women have the ability to make these choices without interference from politicians. That is exactly what today's bill signing accomplishes. These laws were crafted to shield Illinoisans from future attacks by the U.S. Supreme Court and other bad actors who will attempt to impose their backward ideology on the rest of us. First, we're guaranteeing that during an emergency, if necessary, you have the right to stabilizing and life-saving medical care, including abortion. Project 2025, which is the radical right-wing blueprint endorsed by Donald Trump, sets its sights on stopping this emergency care. Here in Illinois, we wholeheartedly reject that effort with the signing of HB 581. That means if the Supreme Court overturns federal protections that require life-saving medical care for pregnant women, Illinois will guarantee they get the necessary emergency care. Next, we're expanding our SHIELD law, which protects patients and providers who come to Illinois from states with draconian abortion and gender-affirming care restrictions. This bill restricts state and local jurisdictions from providing any information or expending any resources to assist another state investigating patients or providers of health care that is legal in Illinois including abortions or gender-affirming care. In other words, we won't assist other states in their efforts to criminalize abortion. And lastly, we are guaranteeing that women cannot be discriminated against in housing, employment, or public accommodations for reproductive health decisions, whether that be abortion, IVF, fertility treatment, and more. 
Six years ago, I promised the women of this state that their bodily autonomy is sacrosanct and that I would work with the General Assembly to enshrine that into law. Today is another day of progress and fulfillment on that promise. But we cannot rest on this because the opponents of women's reproductive freedom continue their attacks. So we will continue to work to preserve women's rights and to ensure that every woman in this state gets the health care that she deserves. Thank you all for your partnership in that pursuit and specifically I want to name the leadership of our Senate President Don Harmon and Speaker of the House Chris Welch as driving forces in our efforts to make Illinois the best state in the nation to live and raise a family. With that, I'm very pleased to invite to the podium our great, in fact, best in the nation, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Hello, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, she, her pronouns. In the interest of time, I will echo the gratitude Governor Pritzker just shared. I do certainly want to thank Attorney General Kwame Raoul, uh, President Harmon, Speaker Welch, and all of the reproductive champions in the General Assembly, as well as the providers and healthcare workers who are in this room standing with us today. And of course, to Governor Pritzker, today the compassion in your leadership is on full display. Thank you for making it clear that the reproductive safe haven we are creating will not be broken. As much as there is to celebrate, I cannot say that I'm feeling especially joyful. When I hear about a woman sitting in her car waiting for sepsis to qualify as an emergency, or a doctor's license being threatened because they considered every avenue of care, I think back to June 24th, 2022. On June 24th, 2022, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling that can only be described at a minimum, as short-sighted. Two years into life without rose protections, we continu continue to see how little thought or consideration went into that decision that reversed the progress that so many of our foremothers marched to secure. Now, states like Illinois, who are devoted to the safety and well-being of our people, are forced to consider amendments like the ones we signed today. We have to be thorough to make sure that when a woman seeks care, the validity of her body is not up for debate. We have to spend time ensuring no future politician can ask, is this person experiencing a health emergency worth saving? We have to stretch our capacity to provide care, not just for the women of Illinois, but for all women in the Midwest and beyond. So today is both beautiful and dumbfounding. As Governor Pritzker protects doctors and empowers Illinois families, the governor of Iowa just signed a fetal heartbeat bill that will push Iowans into our home for help. As we prepare hospitals to function as intended with privacy and care, we strengthen laws to ensure those hospitals and their patients cannot be targeted. While I wish these amendments were not horribly urgent, I am overwhelmingly grateful that we have the tools to protect our people. Because in Illinois, we trust women, and we are never going back. Thank you, and with that, I'll pass it over to Senate President Don Harmon. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, and thank you for being an especially effective advocate on reproductive health care. Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Today, we reaffirm Illinois' steadfast commitment to being a sanctuary for all who seek to make personal health care decisions in privacy and safety. In a time when fundamental rights are under threat, Illinois stands as a beacon of hope and protection. These new laws ensure everyone, regardless of their background or where they come from, can access the care they need without fear of prosecution or persecution. I want to thank Governor Pritzker, Attorney General Raul, and Speaker Welch for the work that got us to this point. And I want to thank my Senate Democratic Caucus colleagues for sponsoring these proposals and their vigilance on this vital issue. 
No one is more committed to protecting access to reproductive health care than the Illinois Senate Democrats, like Senator Selena Villanueva, who you'll hear from in a moment, and Senator Lakeisha Collins, and Senator Omar Aquino, and Senator Christina Castro, and Senator Karina Villa, and Senator Adrian Johnson, and Senator Mary Edley Allen, and Senator Mike Simmons, and Senator Doris Turner, and Senator Laura Fine, and Senator Natalie Toro, and Majority Leader Kimberly Lightford all of whom sponsor the bills the governor is signing today. These laws, the laws that they sponsored, are a testament to our dedication to protecting and valuing the rights of every individual. We are sending a clear message. In Illinois, we believe in the fundamental right of autonomy over one's body and health care choices. We are committed to creating a safe and welcoming environment where all individuals can make these decisions free from fear, intimidation, and discrimination. Together we stand united in our resolve to uphold these essential rights and freedoms. It's now my privilege to turn the podium over to another champion, my friend and partner, Speaker Chris Welch. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It is really an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you this morning to be joining our dynamic governor and lieutenant governor and uh, attorney general Kwame Raoul uh, for this momentous occasion here today. I want to offer uh, a special thank you this morning to a few of our representatives in the House of Representatives, and that's Representative Kelly Cassidy, who could not be with us this morning, Representative D. Avalar, Representative Anna Moeller, and Representative Yolanda Morris for championing these very important pieces of legislation that bring us here today. I also want to give a very special shout out to our entire Dobbs Decision and Reproductive Health Working Group for the monumental work they've done to ensure Illinois will always protect reproductive health care. You know, this particular working group is one of the reasons why I am such a big fan and proponent of the working group process. Our working groups in the House have led to several major policy decisions uh, during my four years as Speaker, and here we are today to celebrate the Governor putting his signature on three of them. Illinois is and will always be a safe haven. And I'm so grateful for the many partners who stand up here today who have helped us maintain that status in the Midwest. Regardless of what happens at the federal level or decisions made by our extreme Supreme Court, in Illinois, we believe that medical decisions remain with patients and their doctors. And I know that every person up here and in the House of Representatives and the Senate would do everything in their power to keep it that way. Reproductive care and abortion services never used to be this incendiary or this controversial. Nearly 50 years ago, our Supreme Court declared that people deserve the right to make their own medical decisions and, that deserve, and they deserve the highest level of constitutional protection. And when they made that decision, that decision didn't fall on party lines. It was a seven to two decision by the Supreme Court because it was the right thing to do. What we are doing here today, again, is the right thing to do. As we watch our Supreme Court for the first time in my lifetime strip away constitutional rights from the citizens of this country, we know how important our decisions at the state level are and continue to be. It is because of the people in this room and so many more behind the scenes or who couldn't make it here today, that Illinois is taking care of people from all across the country who are seeking life-saving care. Again, I want to thank those champions. I want to give a special thank you to my friend and your friend and our governor, Pritzker. I got to tell you, since he got here in 2019, we've been making tremendous strides in this space because of his leadership. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to take him out for a shot of my lord. <laughs> because he's staying right here in Illinois to help us keep getting big things done. I also want to thank Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, our partners in the General Assembly, my good friend Don Harmon, and the entire Democratic Caucus, Planned Parenthood, Personal PAC, and so many others. Uh, we're getting a lot of great things done. We've witnessed how consequential, how consequential just one election can be, how devastating one election can be. And that's why we need to work together to ensure that we have the strongest protections right here in Illinois. 
That's my commitment. That's the commitment of the entire House of Representatives. As the Lieutenant Governor said, we will never go back, not on our watch. I am pleased to introduce at this time a very fierce reproductive freedom champion, someone who's been putting in a whole lot of work for us on that working group. Please welcome Representative Dagmata D. Avalar. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I am State Representative Dagmara Avalar, co-chair of the Illinois Latino Caucus. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to Governor Pritzker, to my colleagues, Lieutenant uh, Governor Stratton, as well as Attorney General Raul. Thank you for being here. And I want to thank my colleagues in the Democratic Caucus for your unwavering commitment to protecting the rights and health of women in Illinois and across the Midwest. Something, something that I have actually always loved about living in the Midwest for the past 20 plus years is the importance of folks being a good neighbor. Recently, however, it seems that leaders in some of our neighboring states that we heard before have forgotten what it means to be a Midwesterner. Instead of helping those who need the support of the community that needs it the most, actually, they are forcing them into the shadows. And today, we are here because Illinois is bucking the trend and sending a message loud and clear. If you are a pregnant person facing a medical emergency in Illinois, you will get the care you need, period. That's not just a statement, it's a promise, backed by the power of our laws and the compassion of our people. Passing this law is about defending decency and the fundamental human right to life-saving care at a time when an increasing extreme Supreme Court is stepping up attacks against our most basic rights and liberties. Unfortunately, we don't have to imagine what would happen if they were able to get away with these attacks. We heard this again just a, a few minutes ago, but we had a woman in Texas who was pregnant through IVF Found, that found herself in an, e, uh, in an emergency room, leaking fluid at 18 weeks. Doctors knew that she would lose the pregnancy, but they refused to act because it would violate Texas law. She came back when her water broke and still they sent her home. And it was only when sepsis set in that they finally intervened. She lost her pregnancy, spent days in the ICU, and her future fertility was damaged. In Illinois, we recognize that a medical emergency like this knows no politics, and a person in crisis deserves care, not controversy. This law guarantees that no matter what the Supreme Court rules, this tragedy will never happen here in Illinois. We are forging, we are forging a future where women in crisis are not forced into the shadows, and everyone has access to health care that they need, along with the freedom to make the best choice for themselves and their families. I look forward to continuing the work of strengthening and supporting our communities by making Illinois, as we've said before, a beacon of safety for women, workers, children, immigrants, and everyone, everyone else who makes Illinois the beautiful place that it is. That's the work ahead. And with this law, we're proving we're up to the challenge. With that, I'd like to introduce my counterpart in the Senate, somebody who I'm glad to call a friend and a, and a great colleague in this, in this fight, uh, Senator Selena Villanueva. So um, I laugh because uh, Representative Avalar and I used to work together at the Illinois Coalition of Immigrant and Refugee Rights and organized together then, and we're still organizing now. <laughs> Um, I'm Selena Villanueva. I am the state senator of the 12th district, proudly representing the southwest side of the city of Chicago and a little bit of Cicero. And I am the Senate Latino Caucus co-chair, um, along with Representative Avalar. Today we sign into law three bills, two of which I sponsored in the Senate, that will ultimately strengthen Illinois' standing as a safe haven state when it comes to reproductive rights. This legislation, House Bill 581 and House Bill 5239, are another step forward in preserving the inalienable rights of those receiving reproductive health care services, and it will further support and protect residents and visitors from the anti-choice actions that threaten to infringe on people's rights. 
With House Bill 581, we are addressing the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act by ensuring life-saving protections remain in place in Illinois and impose civil penalties on hospitals that refuse to provide life-saving abortion procedures. This is more than just a piece of legislation. It is a commitment to protecting the lives and constitutional rights to access vital life-saving care and medically necessary services. Further, with House Bill 5239 to shield out-of-state patients and in-state providers from legal action originating from other states regarding abortions performed here in the state of Illinois. This law ensures that units of local government cannot assist in imposing civil or criminal liability against a person or provider who receive reproductive or gender-affirming care in Illinois. These are preventative measures that have been brought to us by concerned residents and advocacy groups, some of which who are here because I see the Chicago Abortion Fund, Planned Parenthood, Personal PAC, all who I love working with. They bring this forward in order to make sure that no one else continues to infringe on our rights here in the state of Illinois. I am proud of this state. I am proud of the work that we have done. I am proud of our governor. I'm kind of very glad that he is not leaving to a certain <laughs> house in DC. <laughs> Although Lieutenant Governor would have been really, really cool. I'm um, just saying. Uh, I also say this as the very, very proud daughter of a Mexican immigrant woman who was a staunch reproductive rights supporter. And I remember before she passed away, this was the work that she loved hearing about. What were we gonna do to make sure that we were ensuring rights? Because she didn't come to this country to make sure that we lost our rights. She came to this country with my father, with my grandparents, the rest of my aunts and uncles to have a better life, to have a better opportunity. When the Dobbs decision came down, it was devastating. But every step of the way, this incredible group of people behind me and so many others that you can't see on the cameras right now and so many people out in the world are doing and fighting the good fight to make sure that we protect our rights and not just right now, but for the future, for the children that are to come and for the future leaders that are to come. It has been an honor of my life to be able to do this work, to be a Latina woman from the city of Chicago, to be able to talk about issues that matter to my community. And it's an honor of my life to be able to work in the General Assembly along with such caring individuals. I get such support from the Senate President to be able to do this work. And I know the speaker is very much on board with all of it. And again, we have leadership with our governor, our lieutenant governor, and another champion, our attorney general, Kwame Raul, to be able to do this work for the people that are listening to us. We do this for the people of the state of Illinois, but I also, and we do this for all of our colleagues that don't live in states like we do. Because every single time that I interact with colleagues from other states that don't have these protections, the same thing holds true. Keep doing the work and do it for us. With that said, I'm very happy to be able to call up to the podium another very strong champion and a very cool guy, our Attorney General Kwame Werewolf. Good morning. Good morning. I'm proud too. <laughs> you know, as Attorney General, I, I uh, get to travel on a quarterly, quarterly basis to meet with the like-minded uh, uh, attorneys general. And as a component of our policy meetings, we, uh, we on every meeting, we meet with reproductive health care advocates. And our most recent meeting was in Austin, Texas, where we went to the Austin Women's Health Center. And we heard Representative Avila the horrific stories um, that grow out of Texas's near total ban on abortion. We hear about its effect not only on abortion care, but miscarriage care, and the horrific stories of uh, unnecessary C-sections in miscarriage care. We heard the story directly from patients and directly from providers who were afraid of uh, delivering some what otherwise would be routine care. And that makes me proud to have the governor that we have in the legislature that we have and the lieutenant governor that we have to show the leadership. At these meetings, 
uh, Planned Parenthood national advocates highlight what's being done in various states. And inevitably, in every meeting, Illinois' work is lifted up. And so I want to thank you all for that. Having gone to Austin highlights that people come not only from surrounding states, but from way south. In the surrounding states, uh, we have Indiana with a near abortion ban, near total abortion ban, Missouri banning abortions without exception for rape and incest, uh, Kentucky the same, and, and I was recently enacted six week ban. Um, that is horrific, but it lifts us up as a safe haven. And I'm proud and I want to lift up uh, uh, an alum of the Senate Dem staff, Caitlin McKellis, who has worked with the working group on making sure that uh, we have appropriate language in, in all of these great bills that our legislature and our governor has brought forth because inevitably uh, we revisit these bills um, because there are those who try to challenge the great work that we do in court. And I'm here to commit that we're going to vigorously defend all of these laws because, and we have to stay nimble as a legislature because with every move that we make, uh, there are those actively trying to undermine our great work. And I want to thank you all for your work. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jonah Fleischer. Good morning. Uh, thank, thank you, Governor Pritzker, uh, for uh, including me in this wonderful event uh, and for your unwavering advocacy uh, for providers and patients. I also want to echo everybody else's uh, thanks to everyone in this room and outside of it who has worked so tirelessly for uh, so many years uh, for bills, these specific bills and others like it. Uh, my name is Dr. Jonah Fleischer. I am a OBGYN and abortion specialist at uh, UI Health, uh, although I'm not representing them today. And I'm also co-director of the CARLA program. Um, CARLA is, uh, stands for the Complex Abortion Regional Line for Access. It's a statewide patient navigation service that helps patients with complex medical problems access hospital-based abortion care. Um, I'm very grateful to practice in Illinois uh, at a hospital where I don't have to think about whether legal or institutional restrictions are going to interfere with my patients receiving the best state-of-the-art medical care. My patients travel from across Illinois and far beyond uh, because in Illinois we're good neighbors, uh, because they've suffered strokes and heart attacks and similar life-changing diagnoses. They're trying to end their pregnancies so they can stay healthy and in many cases so that they can continue to provide for their existing children. I've heard the stories from my colleagues in other states, um, similar to the ones already mentioned. Patients with ectopic pregnancies uh, turned away from ERs without treatment uh, just because the pregnancy hasn't yet ruptured their fallopian tube and caused internal hemorrhaging. We all deserve to rely on hospitals to give us the emergency care that we need without delay. Today, I feel safer knowing that whatever happens to Amtala nationally, these new laws in Illinois will help ensure pregnant people can access life-saving care when they need it. Beyond emergency care, I also know that my patients expect and deserve confidentiality around their health care, especially when some people would judge them or even lash out at them for these intensely personal decisions. Disingenuous lawsuits or intimidation from an attorney general should never intrude on health care. The bills being signed today make me more comfortable that my private conversations with my patients will remain private. What was once considered extreme is now reality in many states. From banning interstate traveling to, instigating, to investigating clinics and hospitals for, for providing gender affirming care, I'm grateful to live and work in a state that protects all reproductive and sexual health decisions. I'm extremely proud to be part of this ecosystem of advocates, providers, and abortion funds. Still, the situation is not sustainable. There's more work to be done, uh, and I look toward the people in this room and outside of it, and look forward to working with everyone to help secure the resources to continue to help our patients manage this crisis. Finally, thank you, Governor Pritzker and the legislative champions here for understanding and implementing uh, proactive policies with a reproductive justice lens to protect the human right to decide if when and how to become pregnant. 
just like when Governor Pritzker signed the Reproductive Health Act three years before the Supreme Court overturned Roe, here in Illinois, we see the writing on the wall, and we're doing what's necessary to protect all of us here in the state. And with that, I want to introduce my uh, friend and wonderful colleague, Dr. Allison Kelly. Thank you so much, Governor Prisker, for inviting me here today. Um, and thank you to uh, the reproductive health champions, our elected officials, advocates, uh, the funds, and many other folks who join us here today for your leadership and your unwavering commitment to patient-centered reproductive rights policies here in Illinois. My name is Dr. Allison Cowett. I am an OBGYN and the medical director at Family Planning Associates. We are the largest independent clinic here in the Midwest. FPA, in fact, is just a five minute walk away, which is great because I'm in the middle of seeing patients this morning um, and need to get back uh, to the clinic as soon as the governor signs the bills. Uh, when I get back to FPA, uh, the staff and I will take care of patients from as close as, uh, by as our West Loop neighborhood and as far away as Texas, border towns, and the south, uh, southern part of Florida. We see pregnant people from throughout the Midwest and South every single day. In fact, about a half hour before I walked over here, I took care of a patient and uh, did her abortion, a patient from Miami, Florida. I want to be clear. We have seen patients from outside of Illinois for many years. Prior to Dobbs uh, in 2022, about 12% of, of our abortions were performed for patients that are from outside Illinois. Now, that has more than doubled, and nearly 30% of our patients come from other Midwestern states, the South, and throughout the country. Some patients share their stories with me. They share their rage about what forced them to come to Illinois for basic medical care. Some of them tell me that they tried to talk to healthcare providers in their own state, but they were turned away because providers are afraid of criminalization and prosecution for even discussing abortion with a patient. This is not what healthcare is supposed to be. No one should be afraid of going to jail for receiving or providing abortion care. People seeking abortion care in Illinois are safer and more protected today because of this important legislation. But as everyone has said today, we have more work to do. Together with all of the people standing here and sitting with us today, my friends, my partners, my colleagues in this work, we have a strong foundation in Illinois. We have worked together for years to make sure everybody who needs an abortion can get one, regardless of their ability to pay, their home state, or how much money they make, or what insurance coverage they have. We are a model for the nation, and everybody looks to Illinois for how to do it best. That is why every day I feel privileged to live and work here in our state. There is no better state to be an abortion provider than here in Illinois. Without further ado, I hope that the governor will now come sign our bills.
take in any questions and of course offer up anybody behind me um, <laughs> to take any questions from members of the media. Um, Mary Ann. I'm wondering, as we look ahead to November, how much do you see uh, redress of rights as a driving issue for, for voters? Well, they're under attack and we see it every day from the other side of the aisle from the presidential and vice presidential candidates uh, for the Republicans and uh, from Project 2025 and that manifesto that outright says that they want to ban abortion in the United States. So I think that frightens many people across the country. I think it's a motivating force, even for people here in Illinois, because if the Republicans take control of Congress and they take control of the White House, they will pass a national abortion ban. And that will have devastating effect on women across our state, but also across the rest of the country. So we're working very hard to make sure to protect as many rights as we can to motivate people to see this as an important issue for them to stand up about. Uh, and so I think it will be a, quite an important issue in November. I wonder, I mean, this is Amanda. Your We try hard to anticipate. I'll, I'll happy to open this up, particularly to the legislators. Um, but I, I want to say that you know we see that our rights are under attack, particularly reproductive rights. Um, that they come at it from every angle. Sometimes you, you can't imagine that they're going to come at it from a certain angle. And we try to anticipate. These are some anticipatory bills, um, but uh, we don't know. And uh, and so we're. You know, thinking about how do we shield, you know, the shield law is quite important. We've expanded it here. Um, and um, and so I, I, you, it's hard to know. It's, it's August. I hate to say, you know, session, of course, there's veto session in November, uh, session in January. I, I, you know, every year it shocks me, uh, the new angles from which the Republicans uh, try to take away a woman's right to choose. Um, I don't know, Selena. So... As a non-sports person, I'm going to use a sports analogy. We're playing offense and defense at the same time. Um, and that's just the reality of things. Whereas states like Tennessee are passing laws, because again, every state legislator's session is not the same as ours. Um, we're constantly checking to see what other states are doing and in communication with folks. I know that, again, a lot of our advocate partners and, and providers are also checking in with other people from other states um, and having conversation about what's going on in other places. With EMTALA, for example, there was a SCOTUS decision that took, like, basically sent it back to the state um, to kind of decide. And so that's going to be something that we're taking a look at. But the reality of things is we're playing offense and defense at the same time. And with such an important issue, that's where we're having to do until Congress, and again, we have a, a better Congress that is able to act and actually make it law of the land. Governor, we've seen your campaign um, over the last week or so promoting work like this that Illinois Democrats have accomplished over the last few years through the video of your campaign release, um, Bill Boys, I and DNC. What are you trying to accomplish, I guess, with those messages that are going to help the Harris campaign? Well, much of what we've accomplished here in Illinois is the Democratic agenda for the nation that uh, that Vice President Kamala Harris is fighting for. And we want to show people that it can be done and that it has been done in our state. And we're very proud. And of course, we're hosting the Democratic National Convention. Uh, so being able to showcase what these amazing leaders and others have accomplished, I think, is is it's the um, the, the right moment to do it. Yeah, I get an update every day, um, and I think you can also see it online, uh, you know, how many people are, are uh, uh, in the shelters that have been created for them. Um, and so I haven't seen, we haven't seen a change from day to day the last, you know, actually several weeks. But, 
Oh, I mean, I think we have to anticipate uh, anything and everything. This is these are people who are inhumane that are making decisions about whether to ship people from their states to Illinois and may do so for political effect uh, leading into the Democratic Convention. But, you know, we're as ready as we can be, and you've seen that we've done a lot of coordinating between different levels of government, the city, the county, the state, um, and, you know, we'll do everything we can to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing, even if the governors of those states and the Republicans are not. So I know Sarah, yeah. Listen, the, the, excluding myself for a moment, these were some pretty amazing people that, were, that Kamala Harris was considering. Uh, Josh Shapiro, uh, Andy Bashir, uh, uh, Senator Kelly. I mean, really, just terrific, and I've left people out, but not purposely. Um, just, uh, I, I think the, the bench of talent in the Democratic Party is sort of shown off by, I think there were a dozen originally people who were considered. Uh, so you, ha you can only pick one. And I know Tim Walz, and I can just tell you this is a man with a heart of gold and a person who, who cares deeply about the people of his state, but also about every person in the United States and genuinely wants to lift up children and those who are most vulnerable and, um, and working families. And in particular, he has a real feel for rural America having come from it and has accomplished such a great deal both as a congressperson, uh, not to mention as a governor, as a coach, as a uh, member of the National Guard. So I, I'm, I'm very pleased. I, I think most Democrats are really thrilled at the choice of Tim Walz, and I think you got to see it on display yesterday uh, that he is beloved. Um, what I share in common with him is we both love dad jokes. <laughs> We're, we're both uh, regularly spewing them. I pointed this out to my children that, um, that now we're going to have on the national level somebody that they get to, you know, listen to that shares my jokes. Uh, so uh, happy to take any. Yeah, Olivia. Um, really in like the home stretch going into the DNC, can you say anything about what you're doing like the next week and a half to like the next operation? Oh, boy. Well, first of all, let me credit the host committee because um, every day they are hard at work with thousands of volunteers. Uh, and the United Center, if you've not had a chance to tour it, I know they have various tours for reporters, but it, it already looks pretty spectacular. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of work that's being done. I don't want to take credit away from people who are doing that work. I can say that, that uh, there will be a number of announcements over the next you know, week or two about all of what we've done over the last year and the preparations to get to this point. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the convention itself, I think this is going to be the most exciting convention uh, and uh, an energized uh, group of delegates that, that we've seen in, I don't know, maybe in my lifetime. Yeah, Amanda. Uh, that's a little inaccurate. We had a conversation about it. There wasn't a bill. Um, there were some ideas that were discussed uh, when I visited with the Massey family. But let me just begin by reminding everybody of this terrible tragedy and something that never should happen anywhere in the United States, let alone in the state of Illinois or in Sangamon County, um, where a woman who called police to get help asked them to protect her was instead killed by the deputy sheriff. And if you watch the video, in a horrific fashion. Um, and I just, I can't get past the idea that we have to do more to protect people. We've done a lot, and I want to credit the Illinois State Police who did the investigation in a very short 10 days. That's hard to do, um, to do an investigation because you've got to do a lot of interviews. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, a, I think a, a fulsome endeavor and, um, and came to the state's attorney uh, who immediately uh, was able to get a grand jury to file charges. Um, so it happened in a quick a fashion as it can. Uh, but it never should have happened in the first place. And I, I talked to one of the 
black elected leaders in Illinois um, just after it happened to get her perspective. And, um, and she shared with me, because I was so upset about it, she shared with me that even though, yeah, we haven't made enough progress, she said to me that, you know, in years past, there never would have been an investigation. There wouldn't have been a body cam. No one would have known what really happened. And that the, 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 maybe the silver lining, if there is a silver lining in this, is that someone is being held accountable. And yet we have much more to do. So yes, I sat with the Massey family and promised them that we would look at every avenue to determine how we might prevent this from happening to anyone ever again. Um, and I called for the sheriff's re resignation because the sheriff has failed. He has failed to explain how he ended up hiring this deputy sheriff who has been fired from other departments. He failed to put forward reforms that clearly need to be made, training and other reforms, uh, and still has failed to meet with the Massey family. That seems to me, and I'm not saying that's a fireable offense to not meet with the, but that just seems outrageous to me. At a minimum, listen to them, hear them, and then hopefully take action. So that's why I called. And the Lieutenant Governor and I did that together, just to be clear, called for his resignation. Yep, thank you.